This podcast is discussing the topic of early childhood and some of the important elements of development that happened during this time. The time that we often talk about covering early childhood is usually around the preschool years and sometimes includes kindergarten. So that can be kids anywhere from two and a half to six. Um, in an earlier video lecture, we talked about how developmental waves sometimes overlap. And so there's obviously ways that a two and a half year old is still very much toddler-like. And there's also ways that a six year old might be more almost going into middle childhood. But for our purposes, we're using, we're using the term almost preschooler as another way of calling a child in the early childhood range. So, a safe bet would be to look at what this slide is describing as the typical four-year-old. Usually at four, kids have gotten a pretty decent grasp of language. They're more linguistically sophisticated, and that allows them to use their words and language more than acting out, theoretically. Uh, with more increased language and more sophisticated language becomes more sophisticated thinking. And so that's where you can see kids start to think about the wishes and actions of others. They are much more self-sufficient, and hopefully as they move out of the toddler terrible two time, they've gotten some basic skills for self-regulation. At this point, you would say that they're fairly well internally organized, meaning that they have certainly a clear temperament style, usually at this point a clear attachment style, and um, they're cognitively gaining more, becoming a little bit more able to think abstractly, and a, a beginning of personality. Obviously all of these things change over time with the environment, but they've got that now uh, fairly well sort of put in place. Freud would talk about this age range being the neurotic character formation range, which is generally around the time that people start to uh, develop a superego, develop a conscience, maybe is the better way to say this. There's been some much more modern uh, discussions about how this happens, but going to the classics, Freud would say that that begins to happen around four years old. So in previous lectures, we've talked about attachment. But all throughout childhood, we see attachment showing up again and again with different developmental milestones. You're looking at hopefully secure, securely attached kids who have a parent or a, a secure base to turn to when they need them. Um, securely attached kids generally have more verbal abilities and more emotional regulation. They can use uh, words and play and memory and they can remember the sequence of things and talk about things in a more orderly organized kind of way and with gains in memory comes the ability to hold on to comforting objects or comforting memories as a way of self-soothing and now you're starting to see in kids with different attachment styles hopefully the secure attachment style that they're beginning to generalize that attachment style out into the world. So the securely attached kids can go on and hopefully have strong and helpful relationships with people, and the kids who are more anxious or more avoidant might start to suffer some consequences that go with anxious or avoidant styles. Um, a lot of the things that are here on the slide are things that we just talked about a moment ago, but Think about a securely attached kid as being more stable emotionally in terms of emotional regulation, more stable cognitively, more stable behaviorally. Uh, they've had a lot of help in organizing themselves and developing the skills needed for those behaviors. The kids with more insecure attachment styles haven't had that uh, help or haven't had that assistance or that support and they're struggling. One of the things I think that's important to remember about kids and attachment is to not necessarily be all doomsday about it and to say that once a kid at three or four has a predominant attachment style, that's the way it's going to be. I think 
probably we all we all have had some experiences now at this point that tell us that attachment styles can improve and be differently shaped and um, that that areas that were problematic can be resolved. One of the things that comes with problems with attachment, whether it's the, the worst possible category, which is the disorganized attachment style, but even the other two insecure attachment styles, is that these kids can oftentimes be controlling or fearful. And sometimes that comes across in, say, extreme bossiness. And that oftentimes gets them into a lot of trouble in terms of their social relationships or their relationships with parental figures, because it's, it's difficult to um, see beyond that behavior a lot of times. So in this slide that talks about emotional development, we're seeing the continuation of the gains that we saw in earlier stages, being able to have emotional memory. That, what that means is that you might uh, remember the feelings attached to an event rather than the event itself. And hopefully that's positive. Starting to understand yourself, that is the result of early mirroring. If the people around you are mirroring to you calmness and curiosity and soothingness and nurturance, you begin to feel that and see yourself in that way. Being able to anticipate is an indicator of cognitive growth. Being able to think ahead and predict what might happen or what they need to do. And like all, like all kids, they are continuous, they're continually experiencing some amount of uh, guilt or fear about the external world. They, um, they understand that the world is big and that things can be unpredictable, but going back up to that very first bullet point, you can gain self-regulation by looking to the adults in your life under stress, and hopefully they'll help you do that. Um, Kids, I think that's important to also note that there's a lot of messages coming to kids around cultural norms and values, and those are continuing to come to kids both both overtly and covertly throughout their lives, and that has uh, an influence on moral development. We mentioned a little earlier the idea that at this phase in life, Freud would say that we're developing a superego and therefore a conscience, and that helps guide the behavior of kids in this age range. Um, and being able to do things because you know, this is a kind of a complicated point, behave in a, a way that is morally congruent because you want to do it inside yourself as opposed to just strictly having uh, the external structure that tells you what to do. And all of these ways of internalizing things is part of early childhood. One of the hallmarks of early childhood, and this is particularly true of kids that might be in childcare arrangements outside of the home, is the beginning of showing real friendships. And that instead of just being friends with everybody that crosses your path, that you start to show a preference for particular people. Uh, identify those as, as friends more than others. The ability to have advanced cognitive capacity also helps you with social skills. If you can anticipate what somebody needs or what will make them happy or what will make them sad, then you can shape your behavior around that. And that kind of goes with knowing the social norms and think, thinking about learning from others' point of view. And of course, one of the best sources of assistance for kids with this is any kind of a decent preschool environment or daycare environment where the social emotional development of kids is important to the providers. Just a quick word about temperament um, and a reminder maybe about the definition of temperament. So we would define temperament as the biologically based building blocks of personality. These are the things that are kind of genetically programmed in kids. And there is the easy tempered child, which is the child that's flexible and calm and easy to soothe and uh, seems to have a built-in kind, of, kind of ability to not be overly reactive as opposed to with kids with, with more or, or excuse me 
or, well, more difficult temperament styles, which are more easily reactive. These kids are much more uh, sensitive sensory-wise and uh, much harder to settle sometimes as infants. Um, different kinds of temperament, although we attach these words to it, like easy temperament, difficult temperament, slow to warm up temperament, we really should not attach a judgment to those different types of temperament. It's just that child's way of telling you what they need. So for example, if you have a child who's extremely sensory, uh, and that's part of sort of the more sensitive temperament, then one of the things that parents or caregivers can keep in mind is to have a very low stimulus kind of environment. If you have a kid that is more mellow and has an easier temperament, maybe you don't have to be so concerned about that. So from that inborn temperament comes interactions with the world, and those interactions with the world and caregivers and siblings and parents and teachers starts to shape personality. And like understand and generalize new experiences. So for example, if you had a child who did uh, a preschool program, most parents talk about that in the concept of school or going to school, and the child hopefully had a positive, uh, fun experience in preschool. When they go to kindergarten, which all of us might call quote-unquote real school, they can generalize from their earlier experiences that it was a good experience and hopefully this will be a good experience. If you have a child who really struggled in the preschool environment or had a very negative experience, those experiences then might lead, for example, to generalize uh, that quote-unquote real school will be just as difficult. All kids are generally very curious. Kids with more uh, particular preference obviously are still safer, and therefore going to be more curious. All kids also have fears, and all kids uh, are oriented towards looking at parents and trying to tendency to engage in magical thinking. They love mystery and magic. This is definitely the age of, say, the tooth fairy or some other kind of um, kind of fantastical story. They love that kind of stuff, and it kind of corresponds with where they are cognitively. So when we talk about cognitive development, I'm going to have to sort of this slide deck. He has definitely different stages of cognitive abilities and cognitive development. And so for the, for the age range, which is early childhood, he's talking about the pre-operational period. And one of the hallmarks of the pre-operational period is this idea of egocentric thinking. And this is different than somebody, say, who's very egotistical or arrogant or self-centered. Piaget does not mean it in that sense. Kind of the classic example of egocentric thinking would be, for example, if a child says to you, let's play hide and seek, and they run off into the room and they hide their face behind a curtain, and the rest of their body is exposed by the curtain. Because they can't see you, egocentrically, they think that you can't see them. And so they're, it's pretty obvious that they're, that they're not well hidden, but to them they are. And so as, as adults, we hopefully play along and say, oh, where could they be? I can't find them anywhere. And then you go around the room and finally you get to them and they love that. It kind of strengthens that egocentric thinking. Kids of this age um, can be really confused sometimes about reality. And that's back to the magical thinking piece. So in a lovely way, maybe kids are into all kinds of stories about Jack and the Beanstalk and the Tooth Fairy and 
depending on their cultural background, maybe Santa Claus and Rudolph and all of this sort of magical, uh, wondrous kinds of things. But magical thinking can also be difficult for kids. They might ascribe meaning to something where there is no meaning. Um, so for example, the child of this age who uh, had a terrible tantrum one day and then a few days later parents came home and said we're getting a divorce. They may ascribe this magical thinking of I'm a bad kid and that's why my parents got divorced. I had that terrible tantrum and I made everybody really upset and angry and my parents got really upset and angry at each other and now they're getting a divorce. So that's obviously not reality, but to a child it may be that way. And so when you're playing with kids and bearing in mind that tendency for magical thinking and that difficulty sometimes engaging reality versus fantasy, you might want to be really careful with things like masks and toys that are scary or monsters that could be scary because um, they might not be able to, to manage that just yet. One of the things that quick kids often struggle with is the idea that do thoughts and wishes make things happen? If a child says really angrily, uh, I hope I never see you again, and then a parent goes off to work and something happens, does that child, again, with the magical thinking piece, think that they somehow made that happen? And so all of this stuff becomes much more uh, difficult and, and stressful for kids during difficult periods in their life, traumatic events, stressful events. Um, and ask, you know, that's when, that's when some of these distortions become really uh, stronger. So what adults can do is to be able to help calm kids, you know, enjoy with them their new cognitive abilities and the things that they can do, but at the same time be comforting to them when you run into a distortion that they have. They still need a lot of help with that. So coming along with all kinds of development that kids are experiencing, the other the other piece of development in early childhood, and, and it doesn't just belong in early childhood, it belongs in every stage of development in childhood, is this idea about gender identity and how is that developing. So historically, and not always correctly, but historically by age five, the outside environment believed that gender identity is a fixed male-female, boy-girl dichotomy. And obviously this view is very much evolving as gender nonconforming or trans kids are becoming more visible and people are understanding more that gender is not a binary fixed event. And so how kids come to feel about their gender or, or, or to start to think about who they are in terms of their gender is really very much in part of what they're seeing in terms of the norms of their culture for gender specific behavior. Um, they're, they're seeing that there are different rules, quote unquote, for boys and girls. Of kindergarten and, and further on in elementary schools. This tend to segregate. There's much more about what boys do, what girls do. What's okay for boys, what's not okay for boys, what's okay for girls, what's not okay for girls. And so kids often really struggle. They might have had a, a flexible family environment, but they get into school and start to get some really strict messages and start to start to really struggle with how, how they feel versus what the outside world is telling them they should be. And so with all things, kids are going to look to the adult in their life to help shape their gender roles. Uh, and shape their ideas about gender and what's okay and what's not okay. And so I think one of the, one of the um, benefits of sort of this evolving understanding about gender and gender roles, it has to do with, hopefully, the idea that kids are growing up in families where gender roles or flexible gender roles are either modeled or sometimes not modeled by other parents. And that's how things, that's how kids can start to see um, flexibility in these roles and fluidity. If kids can see that in their home environment and see that modeled for them, that tempers a little bit what they might be getting from the outside world and how they, how they can express themselves at home safely then can be brought out to the outside world, hopefully with the help of their parents. 
so there are some early indicators of kids who are struggling around th their gender and how they, how they see themselves and how the world sees them. And a lot of this has to do with kids verbalizing how they feel. And very oftentimes, this starts to happen at stages earlier than early childhood. Um, some of the more recent research that I've read that I've been a part of has participants talking about expressing gender nonconformity at ages two and three, which is obviously even earlier than what we're talking about now. And so that might just be um, expressions of not liking being the gender that, that people have identified for that child or wishing that they were a different gender. Uh, oftentimes, like most things, this gets acted out in play. And the idea that really no pieces of identity are, are particularly firmly set until adolescence or later. And I think as we probably all know at this point that many elements of identity, especially gender identity, is a more of a fluid state than a fixed state. So the type of therapy that generally gets used with children in this age group is play therapy. And there's so many different modalities of play therapy. And if you're interested in doing clinical work with kids, just sort of file it away that there's lots of different sort of subtypes of play therapy that somebody can get trained in and certified in. And it's just really, really helpful to have a lot of tools in your toolbox to say about some of these issues around play therapy. But one of the things about play therapy just in general is that uh, it's intended to be fun for kids. It's intended to be um, anxiety reducing for kids. And the way play therapy, play therapy ultimately works is for kids to just act out in play or symbolically uh, any concerns they have or any experiences that they want to help integrating or processing. And so sometimes problems break down in therapy when it becomes too quote unquote real. Play therapy ultimately should be sort of this area of symbolic, uh, fun, working through of issues. And if something becomes more concrete or if a therapist acts, asks a child to become concrete with what they're expressing, sometimes they don't want to do it anymore or they suddenly start to feel anxious or, or defensive. So maybe just file away for, for later trainings to think about play therapy if you're going to work with kids because it's its own specialty really. And uh, it's, it's really excellent, but much more than you would get really in any, in any classroom environment. So some interventions around play therapy that can be really fun is drama or role-playing, having the kids play the parents and having the parents play the kids, say for example. Um, storytelling, different ways of moving. Kids that are more verbal can sit down and have a conversation with you or you can set up a puppet show or you can set up some symbolic uh, figurine environment where those figures are talking to one another. Cognitive behavioral strategies done in a, in a playful way. Um, for example, if you're talking, if you're working with kids that are really struggling with impulse control, one of the things that can be really helpful with kids of that age is a game of red light, green light. And if you're trying to help, say, for example, a, a parent assert themselves more and be more authoritative in their relationship with their child, maybe they get to be the leader of red light, green light, say, for example. And any game that you play is much more than just a game, you know, it might start out with the game itself, but then it gets followed up with a shorter, more focused discussion about what the benefit is to that child for playing that game. Art therapy and expressive therapies are excellent in terms of what kids can do with that and are really helpful as well. So there's, there's really a lot of stuff in the play therapy category that can be really, really helpful with kids. Uh, supervisors are great supervisors and internships and obviously any any other training you could find would be really helpful uh, to get some skills in that area.